people, when they think about sharks, they think about the movie Jaws, right? They think about the movie Jaws. I graduated middle school the year Jaws came out. A lot of people were horrified after this film. They were scared of sharks. For me, it had the absolute opposite effect. I was fascinated by the film. I was fascinated by the, the creature, the shark, the evil shark in the film. I was fascinated by another character in the film by the name of Matt Hooper, who's a scientist in the film who studied these sharks. And I decided at that age that I wanted to be a shark biologist. I wanted to learn more about these creatures. So I was drawn to the water, while many people were pushed out of the water. They're horrified of sharks. But a lot has happened over the last four plus decades. For one, I've learned that dreams do come true. I got to study sharks my whole life. I've put in three decades plus and I've enjoyed studying these animals literally all over the world. It's been very, very exciting. And science has also changed and the way we study these animals has changed. And we've learned so much about this incredible species of fish. It is a top predator. And as a top predator, it's a big predator, it wants to eat big things. And what we've learned is what it really wants to target is food that looks like this. Seals, sea lions, it's a group of animals we refer to typically as pinnipeds. Anywhere you see big numbers of pinnipeds, white sharks will show up and feast on them. This is what they do, it's part of their natural history, it's how they live. And so, we know there are aggregations of white sharks around the world, typically in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, and scientists have been studying these sharks in those areas literally for decades. But the one area that's been devoid of white shark aggregations has been the Atlantic Ocean until recently, and recently being the last four plus decades. Back when Spielberg made Jaws, he did it on the island of Martha's Vineyard. He filmed right around Cape Cod. And I bet if he went out and tried his best, he could not find a real white shark to make that movie. As a matter of fact, he used a fake white shark to make that movie. And they made up a whole bunch of stuff about this white shark that turned out not to be true. But, but Massachusetts, the northeastern United States, and the Atlantic is changing. The dynamic is changing dramatically because seals are coming back to the northeastern United States and Canada, once driven literally to the brink of extinction by us over the course of the last several hundred years. We, st we decided finally in 1972 to protect them. And now over the course of the last four decades, we have seen seal populations come back. So it's a conservation success story. And it's one that's resulting in big numbers of seals piled on the beaches of Cape Cod. And if you show me a restaurant this big, I'm gonna show you the customers that wanna come to it. And the customers that wanna come to it are the white sharks. So this is emerging now. This central area of Cape Cod is emerging as the only known aggregation site for white sharks in the Atlantic Ocean. And so every day, this drama plays out off Cape Cod, where the white shark is the predator and the seal, specifically the gray seal, is its prey. And of course, the prey does not want to be eaten by the predator. And here we have a classic example that we had witnessed one day off Cape Cod with a white shark in hot pursuit of a gray seal. But this is a smart gray seal. It's figured out that I want to get into shallow water as quickly as I possibly can because this big fish can't go there. And that's exactly what happened in this case. This is the, the seal that learned very quickly how to get away from a white shark and got away. This particular seal was not so fortunate. And so this plays out, this really incredible, natural predator-prey relationship plays out on Cape Cod. This is some footage we shot during one of our expeditions out on the Cape. And what you see here is a natural predation. And the shark is trying basically to consume this seal because it provides it an incredible amount of energy. This is not a mad, angry shark. It's not vindictive. It doesn't have vengeance. It really just wants to eat. And this is what it's done for literally millions of years. 
And now it's got the opportunity to do it again, but it's doing it in a place that we love to go and recreate. But the seals, they're not stupid. Like that seal taking off into shallow water, the seals are figuring it out. They're getting it in their heads that there's something out there that wants to eat them. And as a result, they're modifying their behavior. And in order to do that, they're sticking very, very, very close to shore. This photo depicts a white shark swimming literally within just a few meters of its prey, but it can't get to them, because this fish knows that going into really shallow water can kill it. It does not want to beach itself, and sometimes they do. Sometimes they make that mistake. These are fish, they make mistakes, and that's the problem. The seals are really, really tight to the shoreline. And usually by midsummer, the seals are all tight to the shoreline. So the sharks have to challenge themselves. They have to work their way as close to the shoreline as they possibly can. And of course, that poses problems because Cape Cod is a world-class destination for people to come visit and enjoy its recreational activities that it provides on land and in the ocean. There's kayakers, there's surfers, there's boogie boarders, you name it, swimmers. People love Cape Cod. It's sand dunes, it's picturesque. And the economy of Cape Cod depends heavily on these activities and people coming there to enjoy them. So we've got a problem that has emerged because this predator-prey relationship doesn't really care about people being present because it evolved over a time when people were not present. We didn't show up on the beaches in these kinds of numbers historically. And what happens is, again, these are fish. These fish make mistakes. And they don't do it very often, but when they do, it can be devastating. It can result in death, certainly injury, and it happens very, very infrequently, but when it happens, it can devastate an economy. I know what it's like to be close to one of these animals. We were working one day just off the beaches of Cape Cod. We were looking for this shark that my plane told me about just underneath the pulpit of my boat. You see me on the end of this pulpit, and I'm looking, and what I want to do is basically record the size of this fish, and the fish decided to come out of the water and try to snatch me off the pulpit of the boat. If you didn't see that, we well, are going to show it again, and you're going to get a better view. And I was incredulous, because for a split second, I was a potential prey item of a white shark. That's called the white shark shuffle. <laughs> I'm pretty lucky. I know at this stage I'm gonna need a bigger boat, right? <laughs> I'm pretty lucky. And I think about it though, and I shudder when I think about it, but you know, I'm on, the, I'm on a boat, I'm protected. But what about the person who swims out inadvertently? That shark was in full predatory mode. The last time before last year that we had a fatal shark attack in Massachusetts was in 1936. Matapoiset, Buzzards Bay. A young man was swimming and killed by a white shark. That occurred right at that spot, 1936. Nothing for 80 plus years until 2012, a swimmer was bitten in his lower legs. He healed up, but it took months. Two years later, kayakers were right off Plymouth, enjoying a peaceful day, actually looking for sharks and seals, when a shark struck them with incredible force from underneath putting holes in their kayaks, spilling them into the water. And they had to swim for 20 minutes waiting for help. Fortunately, the shark went away. In 2017, a paddleboarder off of Wellfleet had his paddleboard bitten by a white shark. He was not injured. And in 2018, we all remember a swimmer that was bitten in August, severely, barely survived, and is still recovering today. And one month later, in September, a boogie boarder was fatally killed by a white shark. So the number of negative interactions, the number of these incidents is going up. And as you can imagine, if you have a small business, if you rent your homes or have a hotel, if you're the Chamber of Commerce on Cape Cod, if you're a swimmer, a boogie boarder, or a surfer, you are concerned, and I share their concern. And as much as I wish there was just, with the wave of a wand, we could solve this issue, there is no silver bullet. 
There's no easy way to solve this problem. It's not the first time sharks have bitten people. We can show well-documented cases going back literally decades, if not hundreds of years. There are areas around the world that have been dealing with this for a very, very long time. And there's no easy solution. There's new technologies, but there's no guarantee they're going to work. So the problem for beach managers and public safety officials is they don't want to give people this false sense of security by implementing something that's only going to work some of the time. And there's no guarantee you can save people or keep people from being bitten by these sharks. For me as a researcher, I want to know more about this animal. I'm driven by that. I believe that if I could study this shark and know where it is, when it's there, and what it's doing, I'll be better equipped to give information to beach managers that will help them manage their beaches and ultimately help to save lives. For the last decade, we've been tagging white sharks in this very area. We use a fairly benign technique where you see me on the pulpit of the boat, we go up to white sharks, we place a very sophisticated tag at the base of its dorsal fin. And we're using incredible technologies that didn't exist when I graduated from middle school. And then unlike Spielberg now, we can go out and predictably find white sharks in the only known aggregating area in all of the Atlantic Ocean. And now to date, we've tagged over 150 individuals using incredible technology. I want to know where they are and what they're doing. And I think that that's going to produce patterns in movement and behavior that'll help us predict what's going to happen next. This is where we have seen white sharks on Cape Cod. And when I show this to beach managers and others, they say, oh my word. There's no space between those dots, are there? And then they say, wow, wait a minute, there's nothing going on in Cape Cod Bay. There's nothing going on in Nantucket Sound. And then I tell them, well, my money only allows me to sample these areas, okay? So basically, we're bounded by our research Cape capacity that's changing. We're moving into the bay now. So the, these effort-dependent data that we're collecting don't cover all of Massachusetts. But what's really cool is that the tags we're putting on these sharks, they don't care if we're on the water or not. They're going to report back to us where those sharks are. And so if we look at the data coming back from the tags, we can get a better sense of where these sharks are occurring in Massachusetts. The questions I get all the time from people in Boston or in Situate or in Plymouth or down on Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard is, are there sharks around us? You know, the days of burying your head in the sand and thinking that there's no sharks here are over. So I love it. It's refreshing to me to hear from beach managers and public officials saying, tell me if there's sharks here. So now I can do that. In this particular map, you can see these bubbles. And the size of the bubbles are proportional to the number of sharks that are in that area. And we're collecting data from sharks all over the state. And what you see here, basically, is the outer cape is indeed the hot spot for white sharks, but also the inner part, the western shorelines of the lower cape are where these sharks are going as well. And as you move through Cape Cod Bay to the west, the number of sharks goes down dramatically. Those small dots mean that those sharks are just traversing through there. They're not setting up shops. They're not buying homes. They're not getting rentals. What they're doing is they are moving through to get to the areas on the outer cape where the seals are. They want to go where the seals are. There may be millions of people along the coastline swimming. They don't care. They want to be where the seals are because that's where they're feeding on them. So Nantucket Sound, Buzzards Bay, these are areas the sharks do not frequent. So we're learning about where they are in, in space. And then if we look at their seasonality around Massachusetts, we know they're not here year round. The seals are, but the sharks are not here year round. The peak months are August, September, and October. And as I've been quoted so many times in the paper saying, just because the kids go back to school doesn't mean the sharks leave. All right, the sharks are still here. The lifeguards may have shut down shop. The beaches may be closed in terms of public safety officials, but the sharks are still here. And that sad event that occurred last year was in September, when there were no lifeguards on the beach. So the peak months are the summertime. So I often tell the surfers, how do you feel about surfing in February? <laughs> and believe me, some people love it. They love the idea. 
So we know when they're here, we know where they spend their time. And we can plot the individual movements of these animals. This is just a small section of Cape Cod. And what you see on the right side of the screen are the names of these sharks as they come and go. This is a dozen or so sharks that are frequenting this area over the course of just one week. So we could plot their movements as they're going from one spot to another, as they're hunting off these various beaches. But the problem that I have, and the frustrating part of being a scientist and not being able to answer these questions is, these tags are great, I love the tags. They tell us where the sharks are, but they don't tell us what the sharks are doing. We don't know what they're doing there. We think they're hunting seals, we've seen them hunt seals, but we wanna know, I wanna know, what triggers an attack on a seal? Where does it typically occur? What's the depth of the water? What's the tide? What's the time of day? I can't get that from these data. So we're moving on and we're using newer technologies. I want to know more about this predatory event because if I know more about what precipitates attacks on seals, maybe we can prevent attacks on people. And these are not easy questions to answer. But now the new technologies are there that will allow us to do that. We've got camera systems we actually strap to these sharks now. Imagine being able to ride along the back of one of these sharks. Not that any of you really want to do that. But we can do it indirectly with these camera systems. These camera systems not only give us a shark's eye view of what it's doing, but also record incredible high, fine scale, high resolution data that give us the posturing of the shark in the water column, its swimming speed, its tail beat frequency. All those data could be used to help derive when sharks feed and when they don't feed. And the kinds of information that comes back, the kinds of video that comes back from this, is this. This is a, one of these tags being put on a white shark. That's looking straight down the back of that shark. All right, you're looking basically at its head. And you can see that from these kinds of videos, we'll know when that shark is feeding, when, where, and what triggers it. Gives us a tremendous amount of information, but I, what I also really want you to see in this video is the fact that it's an incredibly challenging environment for these animals to hunt. It's shallow water, it's turbid, not great visibility, and the shark has to make split-second decisions. And as much as I love these animals, I'm going to tell you right now, they don't work for NASA. They are not brilliant. They have to make decisions based on instinct and previous experience. And so they're going to react very quickly to what may or may not be a seal, potential prey item. And so these data will come back and they will begin to tell us when, where, and how these sharks are feeding. And ultimately, as a scientist, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find patterns in these behaviors. So patterns, of course, can be quantified, which leads to predictability, which leads to forecasting. So if we can make all that work, and I, it's a tall order, and it's going to take time, we may be able to forecast when, where, and why, and how a shark attack could happen. Not only on seals, but potentially on people. And that information will be critically important to save human lives. But it is going to take time. And a lot of people come up to me, you know, they say, yeah, hey, you've been studying these sharks for years. You know, what, what, do you, what should we do when we go to the beach on Cape Cod? And I always say, drive safely. Because <laughs> let's face it, the probability of being killed in your car on the way to the beach is orders of magnitude higher than being hurt by a shark. But I also tell them, remember, we're terrestrial animals. We evolved on land. The water is their domain. They evolved there. What you're seeing there is a natural predatory relationship. Don't walk out into the middle of it. In, in the Serengeti, don't go up to the lion and try to pet it, right? Don't get in the middle of what they're trying to do. Think, use common sense. These animals have evolved to do this over millions of years. And then I finally say to them, you know, these sharks and these seals are there, and I can't change their behavior. Not in the short term, and I don't even think I can do it in the long term. I can't change their behavior, but I can change our behavior. We can change our behavior. So if it means not going out off of Cape Cod Beach past this depth, then so be it. 
we can change our behavior. I don't want to have some kind of solution that gives people this half-hearted sense of security or this false sense of security. And I really don't want to change this incredible conservation success story. A lot of people complain about these numbers of seals that are out there now. It's amazing how many people complain about it. Well, this is the animal that will reduce that number and will get into a natural ecosystem. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue on our research and hopefully my next update will show patterns and behavior that will help save lives. Thank you very much.